Hello and welcome to Bad Movie Beatdown! And we're joined at recently achieving transcendence, it's time to jack back into the 90s and go beyond cyberspace in Lawnmower Man 2! Yes, this is so bad, it doesn't even qualify for a separate DVD release. 1992's The Lawnmower Man is not a film that has stood the test of time well. The titular character is Job Smith, played by Jeff Fahey, a mentally disabled man who was taken under the wing of virtual reality scientist Dr. Angelo, played by a pre-born Pierce Brosnan, who wants to help him build his intelligence while using him as a guinea pig. Unfortunately, his experiments work a little too well, and soon Job's intellect not only outmatches his, but he's also developed telekinesis and telepathy that give him a serious god complex in trying to take over the world. It's most notable for the lawsuit stemming from the fact it was originally advertised as being from the imagination of Stephen King, having taken the name and some minor elements of one of his short stories and combined it with an existing script called Cyber God. And King successfully sued to remove his name from all future versions, which considering the crap he's allowed it on, that's really saying something. Quite sneaky the film makes itself seem like more of a King story than it actually is, from the sinister agency funding the VR experiments called The Shop, lifted from Firestarter, led by Breaking Bad's Dean Norris, who likes to speak as a giant posh talking head like this, to Job taking revenge on his bullies Carrie Star, where you almost expect the signature orchestra shriek. It's anti-tech scaremongering, as indicated by the opening text that laughably fears VR may be used for mind control, but it's watched thanks to the efforts of Brosnan and Fahey, even if it really is a showcase for very dated early CGI sequences, such as the notorious cyber sex scene where Job accidentally turns monstrous and literally fucks his girlfriend Catatonic after somehow sneaking into a secret government facility with her. Needless to say, the script is a bit silly, from a chimp wearing Robocop's helmet shooting people to the often daft dialogue that tries to be smarter than it is. You absorbed Latin yesterday in less than two hours hours. Took me a year just to learn the Latin alphabet. You are aware that most of the Latin alphabet is commonly used in English, right? Um, are you sure we don't have learning difficulties too, Doctor? Lawn Merman was in the right place at the right time, since it came out shortly after the groundbreaking CGI integration of Terminator 2 the previous year. On a $10 million budget, it was a small hit, making triple that at the box office, continuing to do well on video with a punishingly overlong 140 minute director's cut. Yes, I've watched both versions, and you're best off with a shorter one, trust me. It also ushered in a subgenre of cyberpunk movies in the mid-90s, often using virtual reality, including Lawnmower Man director Brett Leonard's virtuosity, Johnny Mnemonic, and, um, Disclosure? Given its relative success, it's no surprise New Line wanted a sequel, but given it was four years since the original self-contained flick came out, who cared anymore? Maybe that's why they decided this follow-up to an R-rated movie would be a PG-13 flick aimed at teens who likely never saw the first one, with an eye on making a third movie centred on teens with superpowers. Thank goodness that didn't happen. Lawnmower Man 2 has virtually no one from the original film behind it aside from one cast member. It's written and directed by Farhad Mann, who has worked extensively in TV, including on Max Headroom, and got that show star Matt Furrer to play Job, apparently without any irony whatsoever. Released in the January dumping ground in 1996, Lawnmower Man 2 was a colossal failure, opening at 17th in its first weekend. When you're getting beaten by the likes of Biodome and Dunstan checks in, it's time to call it a day. Worse, the following weekend it dropped by nearly 80% and was making less than $200 per theatre. It was roundly eviscerated by critics and audiences alike, and is considered not just one of the worst sequels ever made, but one of the worst movies period, sitting at a 2.3 IMDb score and a permanent resonant of IMDb's bottom 100. It's not surprising then that they even even changed its title when released on video, now subtitled Job's War. I've heard of alternate titles, but alternate subtitles? It's still called Lawnmower Man 2, you're not fooling anyone. This is a movie so bad, they actually threw it in as a freebie with the original, in a version that's in the wrong aspect ratio and looks like it's been stored in a ditch. Look at this. They both 
both had the same cyber sex disc art, and that was only in the first one. That's how little they gave a shit about this pile of refuse. The film starts where the first one ended, kind of. As the virtual space industry's building explodes with Pierce Brosnan nowhere to be seen, Job in cyberspace is frantically searching for a way out of their system, finding a maintenance line that helps them escape before the whole building blows up. Incidentally, the first several minutes of this movie are presented in 4-3 for some reason. Either they could only get the earlier footage like that, or they were huge fans of FMV games. When the film came out on video, several versions didn't crop out the black bars during the prologue, so they just presented it window box like this. Mmm, doesn't that make you really want to continue watching it? The reason why I say it kind of picks up where the original ended is because it conveniently forgets other key parts of the ending. As seen when firefighters manage to find a badly burned Job in the wreckage, and followed by doctors attempting to save him. This ignores the fact that when he uploaded himself, his human body shrunk into a withered husk and became an unconvincing paper mache dummy. His his head fell off! Okay, it didn't make much sense why transferring his consciousness managed to suck up his internal organs as well, but still, it's bizarre to see a sequel so screw up its continuity while using footage from the first film! It's like this movie was made by people that only read a synopsis of the earlier movie and aimed at people who only vaguely remembered seeing it! Because of his injuries, Job has had extensive plastic surgery and both his legs amputated, which is meant to explain why he now looks like Matt Frewer while piling on the bullshit. He's also been transferred to another VR research facility for treatment. Because if they found him one that exploded, I'm sure there's no harm in bringing him here. What is your name? What your is name? Maybe his name's Peter. Had a wife a good keeper. <laughs> Had a wife a good keeper. Hello, Joe. Did he get a personality transplant as well? Since when did Joe start going around asking people riddles? He was so super intelligent he thought humanity was worthless and need to accept him as their future ruler. Not going around playing children's games. Tell me about yourself. Empty space. It's all just empty space inside. I keep been erased. Plastic surgery and amnesia? You hit both the reset buttons? I'm guessing this is meant to explain why Joe never uses superpowers in this sequel, but this is some of the hackiest screenwriting I've ever seen. Joe does remember a few things though, like his friend Peter playing this new footage by Trevor O'Brien, the younger brother of Austin who played him last time. Peter was a kid whose lawn Joe used to mow, and they bonded over comic books and Dr. Angelo's next door neighbour. Also, Joe killed Peter's abusive father with a mind-controlled lawnmower, but that's not important right now. What is important is the Chiron chip, created by Dr. Benjamin Trace, played by Patrick Bergen, but has had his patent stolen by the sinister company that rescued Job. Excuse me, I'm Jonathan Walker. I, um, uh, run this place. I now own the patent to the Chiron chip, and you can build the chip for me. Um, that was all I had to say. I just felt like awkwardly introduced myself for no particular reason. Uh, did you get that I was evil? Okay, good, 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 good. It's all part of the plan. <laughs> I'm just gonna stand over here then. Yeah. It's not even clear if Job has regressed to his low IQ state, but next thing you know they've got him hooked up to one of those giant spinning gyro spears from the first film to enter virtual reality and rehabilitate his mind. Sadly, he's not wearing a silly full body suit like they did last time. As they scan him in, the computers suddenly start overloading and exploding for no reason, and his virtual self changes back into his gold suit and regrows his legs. Can someone please explain to me what the hell just happened? The only vague the rational explanation I can think of is the way he went online and managed to resynchronize with his virtual self and restore his memory. And even that feels like a stretch. Oh, and it has a few holes, mostly because it requires a complete misunderstanding of the ending of its predecessor. Joe wasn't storing his mind. When he went up the maintenance line, that meant he was free to access every computer on the planet. He promised that when he took over the world, every phone globally would ring at the same time. And that's exactly what happens in the last few seconds. You can retcon as much as you like, but the fact of the matter is this sequel is not only pointless, but it shouldn't even exist. It's only seven Seven minutes in, and they've caused so much damage, I'm already hopelessly confused.
With a bright flash, the screen widens to reveal an unspecified future Los Angeles. You know, one of those ones that shamelessly clones the perpetually dark and dank dystopian cityscape of Blade Runner. And in Roller Skates, Peter, played by Austin O'Brien, the only returning actor from the first. Okay, hold up! This future that we see here is a good 50 years ahead of what we saw in The Lawnmower Man, but Peter is still a teenager? I know technology advances fast these days, but there's a lot much to expect in roughly five years. Since his mother died between films, Peter is now homeless and lives with a group of virtual reality kids his age that hang out in an abandoned subway carriage playing virtual reality simulators. When they're not nearly killing themselves running down train tracks and tampering with highly dangerous electrical fuse boxes. Those innocent scamps. They're like a cross between every child character in an early 90s Spielberg movie and John Connor from Terminator 2. I keep expecting Wurland to exclaim, it's a Unix system! It really doesn't matter who the others are. They're basically all the same personality over three characters and never do anything by themselves and their acting is horrid. Using their homemade goggles gear and programs on mini discs, they jack into VR initially to try out the flying simulator because apparently the director thought the obvious Lost Boys from Hook parallel would go unnoticed by the audience. Virtual reality is also dramatically improved, but mostly so they can have the cast be unconvincingly chroma keyed into stock footage or CGI backdrops. The original movie was all about trying to show off what CGI could do at the time, whereas the flop is about how much they can avoid it so they can keep the budget down. Movie magic! Suddenly the program crashes, causing all of them to fall to the ground on obvious wires. It seems someone is sabotaging the virtual world, represented by all these random explosions. Harvey! Harvey! Harvey put in the cyber cycle disc! Har Harvey! Put in the cyber cycle disc now! The dog just picked up the CD and put it in the disc drive with its paw. If this isn't the site this is aimed at really stupid children, I don't know what is. Can't wait to see what happens when the disc starts skipping because the dog slobber and bite marks. But there's not enough action, so it seems the CyberCycle's disc also loads up a pair of bad guys as part of its program so it can have a pointless motorcycle chase. Of course, the movie never says that in the chaos, so you find yourself at first wondering whether or not these guys are real and they're the ones destroying things. Peter gets separated and he ends up crashing into a tree branch. Luckily, a statue next to it transforms into Joe, whose mug is terrifying for different reasons. So how long did Joe spend waiting that form for Peter? to come across him by accident? And how do you manage to get into their simulation? And if he's the one who's destroying things, what sense does any of this make? Even Peter has no idea who the hell this guy is until he briefly flashes a lawnmower. Not bad considering last Peter heard Job was dead and they have an extremely abbreviated conversation. You're alive. How could that be? There isn't time, Peter. I need your help. The cyberscape is dying and so am I right along with it. I, I don't get it. I need you to find someone for me. Benjamin Trace. You've got to bring him Peter. Tell him I'm building his Chiron chip and I need to know about the Egypt link to complete it. No! I don't think he's breathing. Oh, like, Come on, Peter, breathe! One went down, two went down, three went down, four went down. Right. What the hell was the point of that other than to wake up the audience after a naked exposition scene? And apparently if you get shot in virtual reality, you risk cardiac arrest in the real world. But if you fall out of the sky, you're fine! Why would they program to feel pain? Meanwhile, the Virtual Light Institute, none of whom appear to have aged since the prologue, Kevin Conway's Jonathan Walker is trying to sweet talk a Santa into expanding their cyberspace license. Although I find this hard to take seriously when the building was later used as the Climax of Bowfinger. Man, I'd take chubby rain over this movie. Virtual reality has evolved from a simulation to an actual place. Watch your head, those monitors will kill you. I love not only how horrendous the dialogue is, but how atrociously it's delivered. The way she says it, it makes it sound like if someone made contact with those TV screens, they'll explode. And the best part is. That turns out to be foreshadowing! The Institute is working on the virtual light uplink powered by the Chiron chip Joe is working on, which will be an entire computer network inside cyberspace rendering all other forms obsolete. Now either that's a very primitive version of cloud computing, or they have no idea what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> 
The outer circle represents the real world, the inner one virtual reality. The spokes of the different pathways between the two. The Chiron chip will open up these pathways simultaneously, so a network based inside VR can be accessed by everyone. A vast network that could be connected to anywhere in the world with endless amounts of information and knowledge? Where have I heard that before? Oh yeah, it's called the internet! And I'm pretty sure in 1996 we were well aware of its capabilities to do that! The ability to literally walk into a virtual library is not exactly a selling point. Back with Peter, he's gone after Dr. Trace, the father of VR who is living in the desert. Like the original ending to Blade Runner, if places outside the city aren't shitholes, then why are people living there? He knocks on the door to find... Wow, he's gone native. That's not someone who's renounced computers, that's someone stranded watching Kevin Costner movies. Trace is only really interested when he learns Job is building his Chiron chip, including a disc of the virtual reality footage he watches on his Amiga, which is literally him just fast forwarding through the actual film. Do us a favour mate, skip to the end. You get the impression this is maybe one rewrite away from Pierce Brosnan's Dr. Angelo, who was last seen claiming he was going back underground and never spoken of again. But if they decide to recast Job with someone completely different, then what exactly stopped them from doing the same thing here? Trace meets up with Peter and the gang, who is about to jack in to meet Job in VR whilst Trace watches, and I'm beginning to doubt the wisdom of casting Max Headroom. It's a pleasure to finally meet you, Doctor. I feel like we're almost... I'm blushing. Family. I don't think so, Job. Don't be so sure. Incest. The game the whole family can play. My brother's my daddy! What the fuck? Joe's suddenly gone from cyber god to doing stand-up as a second-rate Jim Carrey impersonator. Probably because the actor playing him is, I can't believe it's not Jim Carrey. Here's the problem with casting Fura, and it's a thing across all his bad guys. He's so busy hamming up, you're never capable of taking him seriously, let alone as a threat. This was probably in production around when Batman Forever came out, so the fact it so often resembles Carrie's Riddler is just a coincidence. He would later copy it intentionally, of course. And this scene only underlines that. You don't look like you're in danger. What do you want? Egypt. <laughs> Come on, don't hold back on me. It's a hidden nano routine encoded into the design of the Chiron chip. What does Egypt mean? I'm not going to tell you. You don't understand its power, Joe. Tell me what Egypt means, Doctor, before I get really fucking pissed off! Peter, get out of there! Peter, Peter get out of there! This is getting out of control! I know it's wrong! I've never seen Job like that before! No one has seen Job act like this before! He's not a psychotic goofball! As well from the casting joke, there is no same reason why he cast Fur in this part and let him run riot! In the sequence alone, he does more mugs than a coffee shop! Annoyed Trace won't help him, Job just decides to go homicidal. Hacking into the subway to hijack a train and send it hurtling towards the carriage the boys call home. Trace and Joe play against each other trying to switch the track lines, but this is completely pointless because the train instead crashes into a construction area and blows out the entire tunnel, causing maybe even more damage. The explorers find a lad to the surface, but one of them stalls because he can't carry the bloody dog. And when Trace helps both of them up, he ends up getting blasted out of the manhole by his ass cheeks. This is an action scene sequence that makes you ask a number of questions like why is Joe trying to kill the only person who knows how to build the chip? Why is the train network connected to the internet? And what the hell is in those tunnels that caused that huge extended explosion? They need to work out who Job is working for and that requires a trip to the library. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the worst scene of techno babble ever created. I can't get past the memory lock to isolate the chain. Simple. Just enhance the memory index. Actualized data. Good five. Here we go. Execute worm function. Enhance. Redimensionalize variables. Ta-da! Now, I could be wrong here, but I don't think the filmmakers have a clue what any of that means. I'm pretty sure half of those aren't even things. Would computer hacking be a lot more fun if it came with mini games? They eventually track down the registered owner, Ellie Pogut's Dr. Platt, who works for Walker and is an ex of Trace, I think. She. She what? Um, editor, I think it cut before the line was finished. 
Okay, given the state of the doll, that's not a total loss, but still. When it becomes clear that Santa is not going to cooperate, Walker and Job look for a replacement. Every time anyone logs onto Virtual Light Uplink, we'll know every goddamn thing about them. Show me all hypocritical Democrats making over 300,000 a year. Wow, that's a lot of rich hypocritical Democrats. Just think of how many they might get if they went Republican. <laughs> The Santa is on the next plane to Washington, about to take away their license to go online. Was he gonna cut their phone line? So in a scene purely to show Job is still evil, he hacks into the airplane's navigation system and copies Die Hard 2 by setting it on a collision course and killing everyone else on board. Wait, hold up, that is the footage from Die Hard 2, you cheap buggers! Movie, you are aware that just because something has electronics in it, doesn't mean it's automatically connected to the internet, right? <sighs> if only Job had superpowers, that meant he didn't need a computer to control things. All oh, right, he did. One of Virtual Light's researchers, Guillermo, thinks this guy laughing at a plane crash might not be very nice and delves into VR to research. Open top secret files. Nosy, aren't you, well, that went nowhere. Don't worry, it's never mentioned again. Also, I question the security of a system where anyone can log in and ask for the top secret files and have them immediately handed over. The Goonies need to get equipment, and most importantly, a tracking device, which can be apparently handily obtained through a shop window. In a move that's totally not creepy, he just shows up in the car park next to Platt's apartment, completely unannounced, telling her Job is more dangerous than he seems, while she's also more beautiful than he remembered. Ew, yuck. This is mostly just stalling so the kids can attach the tracker to the back of her car, which they follow to the Virtual Light Institute, though they probably could have found the location of anyway. It's the definition of conspicuous. Nevertheless, the conversation gives Platt food for thought, especially when she learns they plan to go online tomorrow, and she confronts Walker in the men's toilet. And I think he flashes his dick at her. Why wasn't I notified that you intended to put Job online tomorrow? You're just a scientist. I'm the businessman. He's showing signs of instabilities. I'm worried about him. Well, the man is at a distinct disadvantage. How many times have you postponed his prosthetic legs? Well, I couldn't have him literally getting up and walking out on us now, could I? So they're preventing him from getting prosthetic legs so they can keep him as their coding slave? Wow, this guy is such an evil bastard. I'm surprised he's not growing a pointy tail. And now you think they might not have his best interests at heart? Platt goes to access Job's file, but obviously learning their lessons from the Guillermo incident, it's been deleted by Walker. So she just walks into his office and takes an offline paper copy out of one of his drawers. In fact, one of the guards in the building catches her walking out and just lets her leave with it. What is with the security in this place? The head of the company's office is open for anyone to just walk in and take a look? You specialize in computer software. In fact, I don't know if you've heard about these, but they're called keys. They can be used to lock doors and drawers. And trust me, they're a pretty low-tech invention. On her way out, two of the kids jump in front of Platt's car to create another diversion so that Trace can sneak into the back seat. Bloody hell, dude. Stalk with a crush march. He steals her keycard whilst there before she understandably kicks him out. This is the last thing he and the Lexes need before they execute their plan to break into the Virtual Light Institute so they can try and steal the Chiron chip. The chip is guarded by a laser sensitive to anything above zero degrees C, but Trace has a brilliant idea. Grab an ice cube and have Peter place it above the chip so they can take and replace the chip with it. And the worst thing is, this plan actually works. If your high-tech countermeasures are being thwarted by a simple ice cube, maybe you should seriously reconsider your security! Well, the ice cube thing works for about 10 seconds before a laser melts through it, alerting the building to their presence, including Job, who locks Trace and Peter in and starts trying to attack them with the frickin' laser beam, because that's exactly how that works. Luckily for them, Platt has returned, having noticed her card was stolen and starts helping them, even when Walker's vaguely terrifying assistant Jennifer, played by Camille Cooper, tries to stop her. Why is she all stiff and emotionless?
meaningless now? Is she suddenly a robot? They're chased by the building's guards, who all look like they'd be more at home on the Death Star, and Joe traps them in a corridor with four of them starting a fight scene. The only thing Peter does here is blind one of them with the power of makeup, and leaves Platt and Trace to actually take out three of them. Naturally, the last one is built like a bloody wrestler, but here comes that payoff. <laughs> Watch your head, those monsters will kill you! Especially if someone picks one up and smashes it over you! They make their escape by sliding down into the rubbish chute. Man, this movie really is turning into Star Wars! Sadly, we're denied the opportunity to see Joe try to close the walls in around them, as they simply get up and kick a hole in the wall, and suddenly they're out. Why did I let you back into my life? You find me irresistible. As I recall, you didn't! He just showed up one day and stalked his way back in! And how did kicking down that wall free them? The building is fenced off and surrounded by guards and searchlights! It's like a fortress made out of Swiss cheese! Trace, Pratt, and the kids go to a shack in the desert to take a closer look at the Chiron ship, but there's a slight problem. It turns out it was a fake. So you lost the chip? You idiot! You honestly think I'd entrust something that important to you? Voila! And now that Job has solved the Egypt link, the chip can be activated. It's two nonsensical resets for the price of one! Not only do we just make the break-in sequence completely irrelevant because otherwise the plot wouldn't be able to proceed, but Job has managed to master whatever the hell Egypt is too! Without Trace's help, I might add, so there was no need to bring him in in the first place! So the virtual light up link demonstration is going on regardless, and they're even speaking to the president. We will be joined by hundreds of other prominent people who'll be jacking in from all over the country. So if you're ready, don your iPhones and we can begin. Yes, those goofy looking shades that people jack into VR with are called iPhones. Hmm, that sounds very familiar. Hmm. Also, I think a guy running a computer and virtual reality company should at least be familiar with his own products. Joe places the Chiron chip he's built inside the virtual world, which supercharges him or something, and activates a 12-hour countdown to global interface. Because arbitrary deadlines, that's why. It means that Joe must have figured a way around Egypt, and he's using the chip to enter every system and program around the world, replacing it with himself. It takes about 12 hours for the interface to complete. Once complete, it's irreversible. So they're fighting to stop Joe taking over every computer in the world? Oh, you mean that thing that he did at the end of the first movie before he negated it? He's just doing the same plot again, but stupider! Thanks to a dirt sample left from the break-in, Joe has managed to track down Trace's location and tries to eliminate them again. To do this, he takes control of a nearby helicopter and steers it to crash into the cabin, but everyone manages to escape before the impact. Helicopters now? They're not even vaguely connected to an online network! He's a hacker, not a bloody wizard! And this establishing shot of the virtual city is the same extreme pullout from the last time we saw it in reverse. Joe starts dismantling society like credit card databases, including this shop owner who tries to cut a customer's card for her, and water and power utilities to somehow flood the streets, huh? If he can destroy our world, he figures we'll have to turn to him as the new messiah in cyberspace. But you can't live in cyberspace. Job can. If he can achieve global interface, we won't have any choice. Egypt. Where they built the first dam. Chip is a dam. Exactly. Egypt is a dam? What? We have reached the point where the basic exposition dog has stopped making sense. If Joe wants everyone to live in cyberspace, there's going to be a bit of a problem when their physical bodies start dying, and who's going to maintain the servers in the real world? His plan is completely illogical! As LA descends into riots, people start jacking into the virtual light up link under Joe's encouragement, taking their place in the audience to watch his nonsensical sermon. So is this it? They're just going to watch him babble on in front of a green thingy? Wow, this is the most low ambition uprising ever. Jonathan, Hello? I have some bad news and I have some bad news. Then why the fuck are you 
you smiling about it? Walker and Jeff have realised too late that Joe has been plotting to betray them and confront him. Well, it's easy to do when he's watching the movie. They then act completely surprised when they step outside to plot to kill him and Joe blocks his door. You had the obvious chance right then! Joe then puts the building in a state of emergency, locking Walker, Jennifer and a random guard in a corridor and impersonating Walker gives the order for the guards to shoot and kill the terrorists. So now the guards notice that the people that they were firing at look suspiciously like their boss. Oh shit, it's this doppelganger! Ah! Give yourselves to me. Your rebirth in the womb of cyberspace is a chance for a new beginning to live in Eden without hunger, without famine, without temptation. Seriously, what are you even blathering all about? It's not like entirely transferred their consciousness into the computer, you know, like you did at the end of the last film with your superpowers. Elsewhere, Trace and the gang sneak their way back into the Virtual Light Institute. With 10 minutes to go until the uplink completes, wow, that was quick, they draw up a plan. All right, well, these are the routes for the information superhighway that lead directly into the dome. We're gonna follow this superhighway. Uh -huh. Then comes a tricky bit. We've gotta get by Job, yeah. smash the chip. Destroying the chip won't stop Job. What do you really have in mind? The paradox of the chip is that whereas it gave Job the power to go online, it contains a dam function to prevent the use of absolute power. If we destroy the chip, we destroy the dam and expose Job. I've got to make him angry enough to destroy himself. What? Why would absolute power make him destroy himself? You know, if your explanations weren't complete gobbledygook, I might be able to understand what's going on. Trace, Peter, and several of the kids hook into the uplink using the motorcycle program to ride down the information superhighway, and that also means the completely irrelevant bad guy are chasing them too, so we can have another superfluous action scene before they get blown up! Yay! It's almost adorable how dumb this movie is. The information superhighway is a literal highway? Ah, oh, bless it, it doesn't even know what a metaphor is! Job has spent the last several hours monologuing. They have to keep using the same audience shot over and over again to make them seem interested. Trace and the kids take the lift up to the stage to confront Job, who stops his preaching and produces his sword instead. Peter produces a sword too and throws it to Trace, while the kids run circles around the guards in the background, leaving the pair free to have a completely random sword fight. I'm sorry, I thought we were trying to make Job angry? Why are we trying to fight him to the death now? This is this something become a bad Highlander sequel? Platt in the real world is waiting to extract the actual Chiron chip when Trace destroys the virtual one with seconds left. You destroyed Peter's world. I'm gonna destroy yours. The Mortar and the Audio are doing two different countdowns. And because Job's done an awful job of guarding it, Trace manages to destroy the chip using his opponent's blade. I don't need the Chiron chip anymore. I've become the chip! You've sold your soul for nothing! You don't even have enough power to destroy me! Ah! Ah! That's the best you can do! What happened to me? Egypt, go! Egypt! What the fuck is Egypt? What is even happening? And why just proclaim you as the chip when he clearly was? The overloading Joe blows up in VR as his brain fries in the real world as well as we see the flashback of young Peter playing on the screen and the virtual city is destroyed in the explosion as Trace, Peter and the gang fly away. Does that mean all the people in the virtual audience just died in that massive fireball? We never see what happens to them and Job's kind of destroyed the real world so uh... Yeah, probably best not to dwell on that too much. They visit Job's chamber and find him still alive, but his mind is regressing back to its original state. But then, oh bullshit, Walker's back? How? He was shot a dozen times. Taking Peter hostage, he asks for the Chiron chip, but Joe grabs his leg long enough for Peter to free himself and Trace strikes him, making him fall on a live wire, electrocuting him. There was no reason for this character to come back simply to die again. You could have easily cut him out and no one would have went, gee, I really miss that slimy corporate executive bastard. So with the newly simplified Job, everyone goes out to the balcony to watch the sunrise in the complete antithesis of the first movie's close. Then why was the 
the city in permanent darkness before? I'm so glad there's a happy ending. It makes me totally forget about all those times Joe murdered people, including a flame full of innocent passengers. In fact, I get the impression the filmmakers weren't expecting anyone to really make it to the end and certainly not sit through the credits, because about halfway through... That's really what happens. There's no music for the second half of the credits, even though there's enough score to fill them. Just the silence of abject failure. Precisely what Lawnmower Man 2 deserves. Watching Lawnmower Man 2, your mind makes an easy parallel to another infamous sequel, Highlander 2 The Quickening. The two are very similar in some respects. The baffling dystopian future, the spitting in the face of existing continuity, the endless plot holes, and mincemeat editing that seems to have crucial plot scenes missing. Saying. I think the only reason this doesn't share the same notoriety is that luckily no one saw it. The film so drastically changes everything, especially the ending from the first movie, that fans of it will be completely alienated and teenagers will cringe at the lame stereotypes spouting things like radical. The acting from them is especially atrocious, but it is in general. From Patrick Bergen's Darth Dances with Wires to Matt Furrer dusting off Max Headroom for a totally miscast toe curling performance. As a stand alone movie, it's still mind-numbing stuff, and come on, they were screwed the moment they started making a sequel to something with a closed ending. It doesn't seem like a movie made by people who even vaguely know computers. The script seems to have been written by taking random phrases out of the glossary of the complete idiot's guide to the internet. Lastly, the CGI effects are a step down from the original despite the obvious technical advances, because at least the first movie was wholly digital rather than the constant shortcuts here making it look worse. Even for 1996, this movie was irrelevant. By today's standards, the technophobia of the Lawnmower Man movie seems downright quaint. Hell, if Joe really wanted people to flock to virtual reality, he should have just taken a page out of the modern internet's book and offered an endless supply of porn. Jack in indeed. I'm Matthew Buck, beating down bad movies everywhere. Miss Apple says, mm. I can't do the Apple one, I'm sure. Miss mm. Apple says, great. Mm. 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 So delicious. I thought, yeah, I could figure it out. Mm. I'm going to take another bite. Oh. Mm.